Hi, this is Roger Moore, and you're listening to James Bond Radio. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of James Bond Radio. This week, we are joined by an all-time legend. That is, of course, Mr. Vic Armstrong, stuntman extraordinaire. Uh, he's going to be joining us for a nice, lengthy chat, telling us all about his time working on Bond and a few other things as well. Now, before we get cracking, a uh, big thanks to Robert Sellers, who... Uh, Eagle-eared listeners would have would have noticed at the end of our interview with him a few weeks back, uh, he said he'd get in touch with Vic for us, and that's exactly what he did, and that's how today's episode has come about. It's thanks to Robert Sellers. So big shout-out to Robert. Thank you. Uh, JBR salutes you, my good man. Um, and, of course, what you also want to do is get a copy of the book, The True Adventures of the World's Greatest Stuntman, which is obviously Vic's book, and you'll notice there it's written with Robert Sellers. So there you go. Make sure you go and grab a copy of that because it's bloody brilliant. Um, okay, then. So without further ado, I'm going to chat to. Oh, you know what? Actually, let me let me give somebody a quick call. I know somebody who would be interested in talking to Vic. So let me just give him a quick call. One second. All right, mate. How's it going? Hello, bud. You all right? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. I heard you. Uh, you might have Vic Armstrong on the show today. What's that about? I've- I've got him wait, waiting in the wings, mate. Do you want to come and, and talk to him with me? Yeah, hell yeah. Vic, man, what a legend. He's like stuntman extraordinaire, isn't he? Beautiful, isn't he just? All right, then, let's jump in. Let's go and talk to Vic. Let's do it. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? I'm the British up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio News, Reviews and Discussion for all things 007. You see, as you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, who is the Bond? I expect you to talk. Vic Armstrong, welcome to James Bond Radio. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be on board. I know you don't do a lot of these kinds of things, so it's uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving us a bit of your time today. No worries. Good stuff. So the uh, the, the the first thing we do, we always we do our 007 quickfire questions for all of our interview guests, just to get a little flavour of uh, you know where your where your bond tastes lie, so to speak. So the immortal question, Vic Armstrong, quickfire question number one is: What is your favourite James Bond film? For me personally, it would be Tomorrow Never Dies. Ooh, very nice. What What is it about nice. Tomorrow Never Dies you like? It was the first one I directed second unit on, and we threw everything at it. And I think, you know, you get a really good bang for your bucks. And uh, it, it takes you in foreign countries and uh, shows those countries. And I just I just love it. You know, I've got, I've got lots of things about other Bonds I love, but as an overall Bond film, it would have to be Tomorrow Never Dies. Nice one. Right. I guess with that one as well, there's so many action scenes, action set pieces in it. It's really, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, lot of good fun in terms of the chase scenes and, and everything like that with that film. Well, exactly. That's what I like about it. It's, it's not repetitive. Each, each chase has a different theme to it, a different country, a different feel. And it was pretty organic the way we came up with all the ideas. You know, it wasn't sort of... Um, it wasn't your, your sort of a classical old uh, marched out routines. They were all t- tailored for the movie and for the location. So I think it, you get a good bang for your bucks. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so on to quick, quick fire question number two, Vic. Um, I'm not sure if you've read any, but if you did, do you have a favourite James Bond book? I've never read a James Bond book, I'm afraid, only scripts. Wow, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, cool. All right, fair play. Uh, quick fire question number three, who is your favourite actor? to have played Bond? I have to say Sean Connery. I think he set the style and we're all living off that legacy that he left. Um, I think in the early days, he epitomized everything we thought about what Bond should be. Ladies' man, dry sense of humor, sardonic, ruthless. He was the man everybody would love to be with women flocking after him. And I don't know, it, it just seemed to set the whole style. The others have all been great in their own way, and luckily they all they all made their own style for their movies. But uh, I think he would have to be the number one. I think absolutely right. You can't be a bit of Sean. Absolutely. 
It certainly ticks all the boxes, does Sean? Definitely. Okay, so on to question number four then, Vic. Now, this one might be tricky, and we will give you two answers with this. So if you had to say, who would be your favorite Bond girl? Now, you can have one in terms of character, and you could also have one in terms of the Bond girl that gets the blood going a little bit. I would have to say Sophie Masso. Oh, my goodness me. Oh, I, I cracking would, choice. That is a... <laughs> <laughs> that is a great choice. We did some episodes about the world is not enough just recently, and that that was a feature of our uh, of our episodes of our really? coverage. Yeah, I worked with her, and she was so warm and so adorable and sexy and down to earth and cheeky, absolutely adorable. Beautiful stuff. All right, cool. And what a brilliant bit of casting as well. I think for that film, amazing casting. Absolutely, she was just, and she did it so I don't know so easily. It didn't seem to be forcing anything. It was just brilliant. Yeah, she was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, question number five, if you can possibly whittle it down, what would you say is your favourite scene in the whole series? Hmm. It's a tough one. Uh, yeah, it is a tough one. Uh, oh, my gosh. Because each one is, is a different time zone, so it's different in its own way. You know, the volcano on You Only Live Twice was amazing. Uh, I love the boat chase, i got to say, on Die Another Day, was it? I get all my bonds muddled up nowadays, but <laughs> see, the boat chase I love because that was, personally, it was a huge challenge, you know, when you see on the, all the script said was a boat leaves MI6 and ends up at the, the dome and there's a hot air balloon involved and we wrote everything in between that. So that was a big challenge and I think we came up with an original chase. I looked at lots of other boat chases and thought they're all a bit stereotypical, so I think that was good. But there's so many good sequences. You know, the fight in the train carriage from Russia with Love was, was you set a whole new standard for fights. You know, there's so, so many, I don't know. Oh, mate, it is, it is a difficult choice. That boat chase, though, that is a that is a total sort of like all-time killer boat chase, I would say. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was non-repetitive. And when I dreamt it up, I always had the vision of EastEnders, which makes it <laughs> strange. East, EastEnders <laughs> meets Bond. But the title of yeah. EastEnders, you have that aerial shot of London with the, with the Thames snaking through it like, like a snake in horseshoes. Yeah. And the secret of any, any action sequence is getting non-repetitive and being original. And so we knew the challenges on that were that we wanted to show all the iconic sites of London, but working on mm. one of the busiest, uh, in one of the busiest cities in the world on a very, very busy river. You know, there's a huge amount of craft to go up and down it all day long and there's a 25 foot rise and fall in the tide. <laughs> we knew we had to shoot on there as much as we can to get the House of Parliament, Tower Bridge, and London Bridge, and then get off the Thames. And I wanted to get off the water. So we dreamt up the sequence looking, it takes me back to the East Enders bit with a horseshoe to join the bottom of the horseshoe up where he skids across that on his jet-powered boat, which can go on virtually no water because of the jets. So he links up back in the river again at the dome and stuff like that. So uh, <laughs> fun moments. I'm just glad they didn't use the East Enders theme tune as part of the uh, score for that scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah we, yeah, we could have stopped at the... Uh, the, the pub as well for a drink, but we thought we'd miss that one out as well. Nice. That, that, that might have happened uh, in, in the Roger years if that uh, if that had been a thing. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, Vic, on to question six. You've obviously filmed in like dozens and dozens of, of locations across the world. If you had to pick one, what would you say is your favourite location that you filmed in on a Bond film? On a Bond, I think Thailand. I love Thailand anyway. I've done 16 movies there over 30, 40 years. But, it, wow. you know, I've, I've, been, I've, done, I've worked in over 65 different countries as well, you know. So, you know, I've had some wonderful times in Manzanillo, in Mexico, on green ice. You know, it's not necessarily the famous films that people, you know, they think because it's a famous film, then the location is even better. But there's some amazing locations around the world. And I think overall, I've had the greatest time in Thailand, probably on Bond, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. You're off there in December, yeah. aren't you, Chris? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm going to do pay a little visit to uh, James Bond Island down in Phuket. And uh, uh, I lived in Bangkok myself for a year, and it was the year before Tomorrow Never Dies was shot there. And I was absolutely gutted because if I'd stayed on for another year, I would have totally stalked Eon Productions <laughs> and, and uh, stalked the film crew if I could have done. But uh, yeah, brilliant place. Yeah. Love it out there. 
And, and it was such an easy place to shoot. They were so helpful. You know, I've got a lot of friends out there, obviously, over all the years. And, you know, the bicycle chase, you know, because it's supposed to be Saigon. We were originally, that was always going to be shot in Vietnam, that sequence. Mm. And uh, the we were going to shoot in Vietnam. Uh, we were going to shoot in Kuala Lumpur. And then they decided the Petronas Towers weren't, weren't to the right, or at least Bond wasn't right for the Petronas Towers. Um, sort of uh, as, a, as a as a sort of uh, a, a what am I talking about? Location sort of or a, a set piece or something? Polit- politically, it would be oh. totally wrong. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And yeah. so and so we we didn't do it there, and we came back. We were going to go to Vietnam, as I say, and I sit in the airport, and they cancelled our visas because they said politically it was wrong to, for, to shoot in Vietnam as well. So I said, look, I don't want to go back to the studios. Let's go to Bangkok. I know Santa Pajoni, a wonderful friend of mine who runs a production company there. He'll sort of something out. And within three hours of a landing in Bangkok, we'd found the major major chases, the rooftop, which was a hard thing, which would have cost millions to build. And yet I found it actually in Bangkok. Nice. And we actually flew over That's the streets insane. of Bangkok. We flew over the streets of Bangkok, firing those M9s out of the out of the window with shells scattering over everybody, and nobody worried. It was just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> for, for Bangkok, I guess that's just like a regular Monday, in it really something yeah, crazy it was, like that. It was just yeah. brilliant. It's such a wonderful place. Beautiful stuff. Now, going back in the day, Vic, like if you could, can you possibly remember what your very earliest memory of Bond is? And that might even be before you even started working on the films, like the very first time you came into contact with Bond and what that was. Do you have that memory? I do. I went to see Dr. No when I was a young man. I must have been probably, I don't know, probably 14 or so, 14 years old. I was in, heavily into my horse racing at the time. I was just wanted to be a steeplechase jockey. Yeah. Never dreaming I'd be in the film business, but I, I, I saw Dr. No and I just was blown away. It's just, wow, what a lifestyle. Something I could never, ever achieve or be involved with. It was just the stuff dreams were made of and, uh, and the, the theme and everything. It was great. Beautiful. It must have stayed with you, that sort of one, seeing it on the cinema first time. That's that's incredible. All right, so last one, then uh, quick fire question number eight. If you had to name one, what would you say is your favourite James Bond theme song? Uh, nobody does it better, I think. Oh, that's yes. a beauty. All-time classic. Because funnily enough, that used to be our logo for Stunts Incorporated. I did a pitch called Bear Island <laughs> in the early 70s in Alaska. And I was walking around Juneau, which is the capital of Alaska. We'd have a, we'd work on a Russian liner all week in the, amongst the glaciers. And then Saturday nights, we'd have off in Juneau, which was a rough place in those days. You, you know, there used to be bars where you could actually buy drinks with, with gold dust and stuff because it's miners' wow. town. <laughs> and I, I walked wow. past an, es- an Eskimo... It's been strange, an Eskimo real estate agents. They weren't selling igloos, they were actually selling property. <laughs> but they had these really long Eskimo names, which intrigued me. And I stopped, was looking in the window, and I was like, property anyway. And and they had a T-shirt in there, and it said, nobody does it better with the name of this this company on it. And I thought, wow, that is brilliant. And the way it was written, it was really sort of 60s, 70s style. So I went in and I said, excuse me, can I buy your T-shirt? And they said, yeah, we've got some here. And so I bought one. I wore it back that night on the boat. We set sail from Juno, and we always had dinner on the on the on the boat as we sailed out to our location. And uh, I walked into the dining room because it was just the crew. It was a, we owned the boat and we just uh, lived on it. I walked into the dining room and with this T-shirt that said "Nobody has it better on it," and everybody cheered and laughed and clapped and went, "Wow, this is obviously a good logo." And then a couple of years later, it was used as a Bond theme. It was, uh, so is it, I've got an attachment to it in that respect as well. Nice. You got in there first. Oh, yeah. That's great. Did you uh, invest in any property up there at all in Alaska, Vic? No, I didn't. I didn't. I wouldn't mind, though. I love <laughs> I loved Alaska. I spent a lot of time up there. It's gorgeous. But uh, no, I didn't buy anywhere. Nice. <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right then, so that's that's the quick fire round over. That gives us a good idea of, of kind of your, your tastes when it comes to Bond. So the big, the big sort of beginning of you, your career with Bond back in the day. So that started with uh, you only lived twice, and uh, and and how did that come about? What what was the sort of entrance into the world of Bond for you? Uh, well, the only of twice was actually a godsend to me because I'd only been in the business just over a year. I started in '65 on a pitch with Arabesque, 
And then after that, I did a little couple of, couple of little TV shows. Now I got called up for an audition for a big MGM movie. And this is the last movie ever out of MGM in Boreham Wood in England. And mm-hmm. it was a Gregory Peck film again, which um, Arabesque was, but it was uh, a big adventure thing about the First World War. So I went along for an audition. And there's only me. They wanted a young guy to double um, one of the actors. And I went along. And then they said, we've got one other guy to see, because I was one of the only young stuntmen in those days. We've got another young stuntman to see. He's coming in any moment. And he was, it turned out to be a guy called Bill Weston, who from that moment on was a great friend of mine. Anyway, he turned up with a big beard, bushy beard. He didn't look at all like the, uh, the, the young actor we were supposed to double. So, uh, they, you know, after about three or four hour wait, we hang around the studios. They called me back in and said, yes, you've got the job. And I drove Bill home to, to the tube station because he didn't have a car in those days. And we stayed friends ever since. Anyway, that film um, on, uh, it was called The Bells of Hell Go Tingling Ling. We went to Switzerland. We were out there nine weeks and they cancelled the film. It had all sorts of problems with rain and accidents and all sorts of things. They cancelled the film. So I came home and I called Bill who now is a good friend, and told him, give him an update. And he said, well, look, I'm on 2001. So I've got a contract for this Bond film, this at Pinewood, and I want loads of young stuntmen. So why don't you go along and take my job? So I thought, oh, that sounds cool. So I went up to uh, Pinewood, and I met subsequently my father-in-law, uh, George Leach, and Bob Simmons, and Dickie Graydon. And they took me into this huge construction, which is from the outside, all you could see was just canvas sheeting covering this thing as big as, I don't know, as big as Paul's Cathedral. We went inside, and which was this inside of the volcano. And they pointed to the roof, which seemed up in the sky, and said, look, we want people to slide down on ropes from there. You can do it. I said, yeah, of course I can. I could do that. Uh, never believing that's that what we're going to do. Anyway, I went back, and I got the job, and it's £65 a week. and. Uh, I went back and we got trained up and it was a great uh, learning curve for me and a, 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 got a, a lot of networking because I met every stuntman that was in the business and others. You know, they, they had about 120 people. A lot of them were just heavy, you know, bouncers on doors and taxi drivers and, and crowd people who were physical. And so it was a great networking moment for me as well as a great kudos working on a bond. And I had six weeks on that, which took us right up to Christmas, which was an absolute bonus because, you know, money was hard to come by. I even bought my first car on it for ninety pounds in Ford Anglia, <laughs> uh, which I kept for years. But uh, yeah, so it was purely by chance, and thanks to Bill Weston, God bless him, he's, he's passed away now. But uh, yeah, I was very lucky, and that kicked off you know a lot of contacts for me. So, what was it like when you very first stepped onto that volcano set? Had, did you know what it was going to be? Had you heard about it? And and obviously, when you had to. Um, slide down the ropes. The first time you went to the top of that set, looking down, I mean, that must have been a, a rather interesting sight. Oh, it was amazing. You know, to walk into the set, it was like literally going into St. Paul's Cathedral. It had a, a, a monorail around it, helicopters. They could open the roof. A helicopter could actually fly in and land on the platform. And uh, uh, So we trained very hard for the for the coming down the ropes and the two systems we used, one was an inch thick rope, just over an inch, probably inch and a quarter manila rope, which we'd slide down. We used pieces of rubber hose pipe, which was split and then put around the, the uh, rope and used it as a, as a brake shoe. And then the rest of the brakes were your legs wrapped around the rope. But I was very fit and strong in those days. I probably only weighed about 10 and a half, 11 stone. And I was racing horses at the time, so my power to weight ratio was very, very good. So I could stop my weight. A lot of the bigger, more muscular people used to have problems because of the weight coming down. And if you're at all cautious when you came down the rope, it's 125 feet, it was a long way. If you're at all cautious you're, and you had the brakes on too much on the way down, you got brake fade when you got to the bottom when you really needed them. So it sort of compounded. But I tell you, there was nothing so scary as climbing out to your rope. That was the hardest, most dangerous piece. Because in those days, we never had safety belts or wires or anything else. And the roof was like three foot six from the bottom of the bar. So you had to be bent over in three foot six with your toes on an angle iron, holding the slanting uprights as you inch your way out, probably 60, 70 feet out into the middle of the volcano, over your drop zone or to your rope, wherever your rope happened to be attached. 
And that was the worst thing in the world because it was cold in the winter. There was all condensation on them and your hands were slipping. And <laughs> I don't forget once I got into my position and we had these Sterling submachine guns and we were going to come down using figure eights, which is a, 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 a descending machine they use for climbing nowadays. And I'm in position and you're nervous, you're, you're twitching and I'm getting my ass ready to get right on the edge of the beam ready so I get a quick drop. I used to pride myself on racing the others down. And as I did that, I must have tensed the trigger finger and <laughs> the machine gun went off. And what I saw about six or seven asses in front of me go, pee, pee, and see, <laughs> see <off there. laughs> you can understand the tension when you're up there waiting for something to say action. I can imagine. I go up your backside. <laughs> so, something, so I'm, bit- <laughs> something I'm curious about is that like, for, I'm the sort of guy that likes to have my feet firmly on the ground. If somebody says, let's go and do a bungee jump, my immediate reaction is no thank you i'm i'm going to stay right here with my cup of tea i'm very happy with that somebody like you who does this stuff for a living like where do you think that comes from like to be able to stand up on this huge thing and and zip down as fast as you as you possibly can or you know doing these crazy stunts do, do you is there like have you just been not really that scared of that stuff or or is there something different about somebody like you that can just throw yourself off a building and not worry too much no, quite the contrary. Very often I was terrified. And the night before, you, your nerves are going. Most of the time, it's fear of failure as a stuntman. If you're terrified of failing, because normally when there's a stunt going on, you are the center of attraction. Everybody watching thinks they could do it better, like somebody watching somebody taking a penalty. Everybody in the stands could stop core. Yeah. But it's a different kettle mm-hmm. of fish when you're, you're in there. But even so, I hated heights as a young man, absolutely terrified. And... I'm a great believer in mind over matter. You know, I'm, I'm a big guy and I used to get down. I actually rode in a race at Sandown Park at 10 stone three, which made me nine stone 11 stripped. And, you know, I'm six foot one and I've got big bones. And, but I forced myself to do that because that's something I wanted to do. And the same with the bond, with the heights. I would go up there every chance I got, get to the very top, the highest position, look over and look down and look down and look down. And familiarity breeds contempt. So the more you look down, the more you look down, it ceases to become as high. Mm. It's still terrifying knowing what you're going to do. And it's the same with everything I've done. I've always trained for it and focused my mind over on what I'm going to do and tried to allay most of the fears. And uh, it does work. There's a wonderful Chinese proverb that I always said should be a stuntman's proverb. It is fear knocked at the door, knowledge answered, and found no one there. So when you dissect that, it's the fear of the unknown that's terrifying. When knowledge knocked on the door, when you get the knowledge of what you're going to do, you know what to expect. You might be nervous, you might be worried, but you know what you're what you're confronting. Yeah. And it's, it's a great saying, and I, I use it in my mind a lot of times, whether I have to make a speech at, when I've got an, a BAFTA in front of my peers, who are all actors who do that for a living. <laughs> you go you know, you go into Leicester Square and you're standing in the theatre there, the Odeon, and you have to make a speech. It's nerve-wracking, but you condition yourself and uh, so on. So I rehearse a speech over and over and over again. So that that is the knowledge, as it were. So um, it's just a case thing. of overcoming these things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So last mm-hmm. summer we went out to the to the Varaska Dam uh, from Goldeneye and Chris did the bungee jump and some of our other buddies wow. did, the, wow. did the jump as well. And I looked over the edge and immediately I'm just like, oh my God, my knees are turning to jelly. I, I could barely even look over the edge without freaking out. But uh, but Chris, you were brave enough, weren't you, buddy? To me, that was one of the greatest Bond stunts ever. That was phenomenal how Wayne Michaels did it. Because I know I, t- I spoke to him afterwards and he, he went on a recce like myself. He always recce everything out and you check it out. And at the, on the way, just before the bottom, there was a, a cement block building and he went down and he just he checked that out for some reason or other. And he could see imprinted in it with the no, um, Levi jeans and even the stud mark of the jeans in the top of it. And he questioned the, <laughs> the guide with him and somebody yeah. committed suicide there beforehand. And no he way. still had the balls to go out and do the jump. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just yeah. stunning. It, that was That's amazing. Crazy. But my, my, my other great motivation is money. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That'll do you. Yeah, that's the I same won't. for all of us, Vic. All of us. I won't do bungee jumps for free or anything like that. But if there's money involved, because they're the ones you get hurt on. Everything you do is the little cheapies you get bashed up on. So, uh, no, money is my great motivation, really. It, 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 uh, it calms a lot of my nerves. That does the job.
Um, I, there was just one quick question more about you only live twice. So I've read quite a lot that you were the first ninja to go down. So in terms of how that happened, did were you told that you'd be the first one or did they call action and you were just the quickest ninja off the mark? How did that work? Yeah, it was just um, every man for himself. It was, uh, it was a race at the beginning. You're all there and action and away you go. And so I always used to like be on the edge of the, probably to get it over, like tearing a plaster off. The quicker you do it, the quicker it's over. So I'd just get my ass right on the edge of the beam. And as I said, I used to like to fall. I'd even put talcum powder in, in the in the brake shoe, if you like, so that it would um, it would go free at the top. So you'd be falling a lot faster, but you had a lot more rubber at the end when you turned the brakes on because smoke would pour out of it when you turned the brakes on. So, no, I, I just yeah. used to be quick out the mark and get it over with. Following on from that, it was a couple of years later then, you got a call to work on the next Bond, which was on Her Majesty's Secret Service, and that was the first time you ended up as Bond, sort of doubling for George Lazenby. So what particular scenes did you double for George? And you must have got an extra kick, that the fact that you're actually portraying Bond for those scenes as well. Oh, absolutely. It was a great honour. I was actually one of the second. I wasn't the first pick either. I was, uh, I'd was. i love to have gone on it, but uh, I was called um, just after Christmas. I remember I'm a great believer in fate, which I mentioned a lot in my book about fate, you know, and fate does have a, a huge hand in, in everybody's lives, good or bad. And I'm a great believer in when fate smiles at you, you grab it with both hands and go for a dance with it. But uh, I was called, I was down to my father's stables one day, we were going to exercise the horses, and I went down in the afternoon to do evening stables, and uh, the phone was ringing, and there's nobody in the house, so I picked it up, and they said, hello, uh, looking for Vic Armstrong. I said, that's me. Oh, great. Are you free next week for two weeks? I said, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll get back to you. I'm like, oh, God, I don't even know what it is. Anyway, they called back that evening and said, okay, you're leaving on, you know, two days' time on such and such a flight. Uh, I said, what, what is it? What am I leaving on? And they said, it's Bond. I went, oh, oh, great. Oh, wonderful. That's great. And I went out for two weeks and had nearly three and a half months there. So, but uh, <laughs> a great. Uh, and most of the stuff I did for Bond, again, Wendy's dad, George Leach, was the stunt coordinator on it. I was picked to double Bond on the uh, action unit, the second unit. And uh, it involved the fights. Initially, I went out there. Actually, I was initially gone out there for the attack on the uh, the shield on the uh, on the Pitts Gloria, where the helicopters come in, and we had to jump out of the helicopters and all that stuff into the snow, and then run up and all at ten, twelve thousand feet. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I did all that, and that went on for months, and then or weeks and weeks, and then the the second unit came back to London, and we stayed on. And the first unit came back to London. Uh, we stayed on with the second unit, and then did fights and all sorts of stuff. I did the bit with Bond at the end of the ski chase. I'd love to say I did his skiing, but uh, no. Mm-hmm. We had a wonderful guy called Lucky Lightner who could just just magical on skis. I did the end bit where he crashes and goes over the cliff and hangs up upside down and climbs back up again. I did that. Um, but funny enough, I've been out there twice the last two years to Murren with George Lazenby and a few of the remaining crew because of the 50th anniversary. I've had a wonderful time there. And one of the times, actually, when we came back to London, we had a screening in London as well, and they played the movie. And I was absolutely blown away how good the movie was and how well it stands the test of time. It's yeah. The story for Bond is actually really one of the better stories, I think. It's, it's beautifully told, and it has a, a great flow to it. You know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, it obviously looks a touch bit dated now, but it's, it's still one heck of a good movie. It's a great one. It's my, my all-time favourite is mm-hmm. Majesty's. That's a, that's a great one. Chris and I were both there for the 50th anniversary last year as well. What a, what a great event that was. Where were you? In London? No, in the uh, screening? In, uh, in, in Murren. In Murren, yeah. Oh, you came out there. All oh, yeah, right, yeah. right. That's where we saw you, was it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so absolutely. many people there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. It's a wonderful exhibition they've got there, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. great. And uh, I've got one of those lovely um, monuments on top of there, the Pete's Gloria as well. You know, there's about eight or ten. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So I said to Wendy, when I go, you don't need a headstone. Just get the ashes and dip them <laughs> on top of the mountain. I've got, I've got <laughs> yeah. a headstone there already. That's a beautiful thing. I remember we, we went out twice last year. So we went out in February because we thought by June when the event was, we'd, uh, there, we thought there wouldn't be any snow left, which of course there still was snow in June. Uh, when we went in February, the snow was so thick. We went out onto that Walk of Fame bit and all, all you could just see was the tops of everybody's heads yeah. out there because the yeah. snow was so deep. Yeah. 
Well, I went out there in the summer with Wendy and we had a wonderful time and she'd never ever been there. So that she enjoyed it in the summer. I said, well, you've got to see this place in the winter because it's absolutely magical. Yeah. So we did go back in the winter in the snow and it was great. It was wonderful as well. And funny enough, I did a picture, a, a sequence on the Golden Compass. Yeah. They wanted an extra sequence oh, yeah. with yeah. Daniel Craig, with Daniel Craig, funnily enough, where he's chased by these, these creatures up in the glaciers. And they wanted to shoot it in Sweden. And I said, well, there's no infrastructure in Sweden. I said, we could do it in Switzerland. They said, no, 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 no. This is supposed to be the North Pole. as, as The mountain's too big in, in Switzerland. I said, no, no, if we go on to the top of the Jungfrau Jock, where we shot the Bond, there's this glacier, and then it's 10,000 feet up, and the mountains are 12,000 feet. So you just have a 2,000 difference between the glacier and the mountains, and it looks like the North Pole, which is, in fact, where we did shoot it. So nice. I'd remember that 40 years previous. <laughs> How funny. That's cool. We'll have to look out for that. Um, so next up then, you worked on Live and Let Die, Roger Moore's first. Um, but you you had a bit of a nasty accident on that one. Is that right? Yes, I... Live and Let Die was another great learning curve for me because I got called in. The Norm, Rogers Norman double wasn't available for various reasons. And I got called in to double Roger in the fight with the Afik Koto in the shark pen, they called it. And so I got to work with the great Bob Simmons, who, in fact, invented the action on Bond with George Leach. He was, they, they created the whole style of fighting, which until then was pretty hokey, but not hokey, yeah. but uh, they really modernized fighting. Bob Simmons, through natural instinct, knew how to edit a fight, how to cut a fight, and uh, all these sort of things. So I went along, so I had weeks working with Bob, working out the fight. So I, I learned a lot of how you actually you know, do construct a fight and dissect it and tell the director, this is the good bit for you guys to do. This is what we could do over here. This is what a double could do. And you're right, I had a bit of an accident on that because I was doubling uh, Roger with Sapphire, was it the woman? Because the character's name? Solitaire. Uh, Solitaire, that's it. Solitaire. On that platform, it's lifted up in the air. It's a platform with a bar across the top. And we're tied up. And I've got the, the watch with the worry handle that cuts the, my rope free. I mm -hmm. cut it free and I turn, bend down and pick the handrail on the, on the platform we're standing on and then throw a handstand and do a big swing round and land. And... We'd done it close to ground, close to ground, onto pads and everything else. Anyway, on the day of the shoot, or no, one of the rehearsals, we took it up and I did, actually it was a shoot, we did the shot and I came round and this thing, because there was no strengthener on it, tilted like that. So I dropped another two feet and smashed my heel straight into the cement, mm. which we hadn't allowed for, which again taught me a lot of things about rehearsing. But yeah, I smashed my heels in, mm. into the cement and uh, I literally couldn't walk. I went to the toilets and got some toilet paper and pulled it up and put it under the insteps of my feet so that nothing could touch the heels <laughs> i was hobbling around like i was wearing stilettos but nothing under my heels yeah. i literally had to go upstairs on my hands and knees yeah. but then of course i had to do it again the next day so i got away with it anyway but uh taught so, me a lesson that, about that's rehearsing the thing, and that, that's the thing with stuntmen i think any other profession any other sort of job if people had any sort of injury or, or something like that it'll be right stop it now that's it they can't do anymore with stuntmen it's just shove some toilet paper in your shoes come back the next day with a few painkillers and hit it again and that it's just crazy isn't it oh absolutely and that's I, my life's always been like that though you know we didn't have a lot of money and you had to work and uh you know the, the thing is if you the only reason not to turn up for work or be late is because you're dead <laughs> the excuse you have. Uh, that's a good quote yeah, I think uh, a lot of our professional football players could do with uh, living by that sort of uh, motto, couldn't they? Eh? I guess, I guess yeah. you know it's 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 difficult in yeah. different situations, but uh, you know the thing is, if you're a stunt man and you're not fit, you're not working. You know, if you're injured, you're out of out of a job. You know, and uh, I've only ever lost probably a week's wages through injury through a whole career, and I've broken a shoulder and uh, bust my knee up and things like that. Because the companies have kept me on the payroll and I've had bad injuries like my knee, but I kept on working on Indiana Jones. And my broken arm was only because I, I was in, in hospital for a couple of three days and then they put plaster on it. But as soon as I came out of hospital, I trimmed the plaster back and pulled the sweater that I was wearing down. And he was riding a horse, so I just rode him one handed. So I came back to work again. <laughs> but uh, if you're not working, you're not earning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's just it. 
Well, so following on from that, you had a bit of a gap, I think, with the Bonds. And the next one, I believe he came back, was on Never Say Never Again. Uh, and once again, he got to play Bond, sort of doubling this time Sean Connery, along with Wendy was doubling Kim Bassinger, I believe. So what, can That's you tell right. us a bit about how that film came about? Yeah, that um, we'd done Raiders and everything else. And uh, Dave Tomlin, the AD, he was a wonderful, wonderful AD, the one of the best in the world. He was he was prepping it with uh, with uh, Sean and everything else. And we were a bit of a team. We'd done a lot of movies together, Dave Tomlin and I, from Bridge Too Far to uh, 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 Bridge Too Far. And um, what's the one? Oh, can't think of a thing. But we'd worked together a lot, Superman, stuff like that. And he was doing that, doing Never Say Never, and he obviously wanted me for it, so I'd be a good double for Sean. So I got the job as a stunt coordinator and uh, double as well. So it was it was a great movie to work on. It wasn't terribly successful. It had a lot of politics to it. But uh, it, was, it was quite funny because it was the film, the only Bond film, I suppose, Casino Royale with Sellers was made outside of the Eon on banners. But uh, this, I never forget, I was working on one of the later Bonds with Pierce Brosnan, and I mentioned Never Say Never Again. <laughs> Barbara Broccoli was in the room and she gave me a terrible telling off. She said, never swear like that in front of me again. All I did was make, <laughs> say never, say never again. <laughs> that is so funny. Thank you. But, uh, I was, yeah, I, I rough, was, ruffled a lot of feathers, but it was work, was work, and you, you know, it's what you do. Yeah, I was going to say, was was there ever any any sort of feeling like that of going to work for the competition with, with Eon or anything like that? Or, or was it all in sort of good fun? No, it was, you know, I, I wasn't on the Eon team at that time. I'd done three movies with them, but I was just a jobbing stuntman. So, uh, no, it didn't feel in any respect. It was just another movie. You know, you just go you with a stuntman. You go wherever the money takes you and where the job is. And if you've got a choice, you try and take the best choice. Yeah. And uh, it was only later when I did Tomorrow Never Dies, I did really feel part of the wonderful Broccoli Eon production family because they are fantastic. But that was because I was more on the production side of it as a coordinator and second unit director, and it was more involved in the construction of the movie and the, the ideas and everything else. So I felt a tremendous loyalty once I'd got to that stage. Sure. But, uh, before yeah. that, it was just an, another movie, which was great working in the south of France, and Sean's always fun to work with, and uh, it was great. And we flew, went all around the world, the Bahamas, all sorts of places. It was terrific. Nice. So the, I suppose the, the kind of the set piece stunt, or at least one of them in Never Seen Ever Again, is obviously the horse jumping off the, the castle into the water and all that kind of stuff. And that, that was, you You were up on that horse and you did that whole thing. So how did that go? Like, what, what was that like doing that stunt? That was really weird because we um, we knew the stunt and we knew what we were going to do. And uh, we, while we were in the Bahamas, we'd done some testing for it because I was worried when 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 the horse came down the chute, it would do a somersault and land on top of me. Yeah. And and Wendy, uh, so we did some tests there, but the hard thing was finding a base big enough with water that was deep enough close to the base where you could do the dive and somewhere where the horse could get out. A lot of things we had to find in it. So we built a test one in the Bahamas and put rocks in it. And as it as the, the chute tilted and the slope became a slope for the horse to slide down, the whole thing came off. We'd have been absolutely killed if we'd have been in it. So we, we abandoned it in the Bahamas. And in the end, we said we're doing Spain because we'd found a lovely um, boat uh, marina, yacht marina. They had vertical walls, but had a nice sloping sloping ramp where they they bring the the boats in and out. So a good base with a vertical wall, we could build the the, the tower right next to it. I've got a picture of it up there somewhere on the wall behind me. I had a picture, had the tower, and as we hit the water, my plan was to stay underwater as best I could. The horse would swim back up the the ramp and out. And we were down there for three weeks with the horse, and we'd lead him into the water. We'd have boats escorting him and swimming out to where the tower was, turning around and taking him back out. And we'd do that two or three times for several reasons. One, to get him accustomed because they're creatures of habit animals. He trained them by habit. He would swim out. And as soon as he got to this certain position, which he'd know from the, where the tower was, he'd turn and come back. We did that three or four times a day. And the other reason was to get his, his breathing up as well because it's, you know, how exhausting swimming is. 
So you had to get him fit and, and well for that. And his lovely old horse, I'd, I'd ridden him over many, many years, a Spanish stunt horse called Toupe. And uh, so we did it. And I was living in a, a boat on the marina, funnily enough. And so every morning I'd wake up and I could hear people basically what I thought was building gallows. It sounded like building gallows in the old westerns <laughs> outside the cell. I could bang, 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 and they're building this scaffolding. And I kept looking at it every morning and think, my God, that's going ever so high. Jeez, that's higher than I thought it was going to be. And, in, and we had a big ramp up to it for the horse to walk up. And in the end, when we did it, the horse came out, but reared up as he jumped out. So if I was sitting on him, sitting forward, ready to keep his head up, thinking he was going to do a front somersault. And he came out and came over backwards. So I've got a shot of it. I'll show you, actually, in a second. Of him coming down vertically. I got my hand on his head and keeping him forward. So he came down ver vertically, went in on his bum. I stayed underwater, and when I surfed, he was actually walking up into the horse box. He was gone. Um, but, yeah, people said it was cruel. They made him take it out of the movie, but it wasn't. You know, horses do that. There was, I've got videos of them in uh, Coney Island in New York where they had mules doing it yeah. at the time. I'll show you the picture. It's here somewhere. Let me have a look. Da, 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 da. Oh, there he is. So he's above that speaker there. Can you, can you see it there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Is it, is just it underneath Sir Roger. Yeah, yeah, we're just underneath Roger as a Nazi. There it is, yeah. That's it, yeah. That's on <laughs> Escape to Athena, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was just a build up to it, though. That's the, that's the nerve wracking thing. As I say, you wake up every morning, you hear these scaffolding things, and you look out, and you go, oh my God, that's getting higher and higher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can imagine. <laughs> but some good, some good stunts on it. I didn't do the motorcycle stuff. A wonderful motorcycle called Mike Runyard. Did that. Um, yeah, so it was, it was a good movie, but it's a movie's a movie, you know, and uh, there you go. Absolutely. So there was um, something else that which we found out quite recently, which I thought was, was really uh, interesting, that although you weren't officially working on the Bond film, The Living Daylights, I, I believe, you did actually help them sort of test Bond by you helped out on the fight scenes where obviously Roger had finished and they were looking for the new one. I mean, this for us is so intriguing. Were you there for when Timothy did his fight test and did you see Pierce or were there any other actors who you thought did really well during the fight tests? Yeah, we did several actors, actually. I can't even think of their other names. They were quite well known at the time. But I was, I was auditioning them, but for my mind, because I thought I might be doing the film, I was auditioning stuntmen as well, you know, and we had some great stuff. In fact, I think Simon Crane was one of my, my early stunt. He's a really, really young lad. And I said to somebody else, I said, this guy's got real talent. He's a hell of a good fighter. Because it's a natural instinct when you're fighting that, to... You know, it's like playing cowboys and Indians, really, but you're not hitting anybody, but you have to you have to think it out and feel it out and act it out. So, um, yeah, we, we I was up there quite a bit on the back lot at Pima doing all the testing for them, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Interesting. So talking about your, your favourite Bond film next, Then Tomorrow Never Dies, um, so you were the second unit director on that movie. Now, when you, when you look into the sort of the making of Tomorrow Never Dies, you tend to hear a lot of stories about it was a really sort of chaotic, trouble production, loads of last minute rewrites, all sorts of craziness going on. What, what was your memory of that? From your perspective, was it, was it, was it a chaotic production or was it for, in your sort of corner of the film, was it more or less okay? I think it was more or less okay. You know, the press have a lot to, to deal, do with all these sort of rumours that go out. Roger Spotters with the director is a great friend of mine. I'd done Air America with him and we got on really well. Again, up in um, Thailand, did a lot of stuff for him up there, shot a lot of stuff for him. And I was finishing Starship Troopers in LA and I got a call from Roger and said, Vic, said, I'm doing this Bond film. Uh, would, I'd love you to do it with me. I said, oh, absolutely. Sure, sure. I'd love to, Roger. I said, when can you get back? And I said, well, I'm finishing this week. I'll be back in London next week. So he said, well, come and see us as soon as you're in. So I flew back to London. I got a meeting to go up to Eon Productions. And I got up there and they started giving me a bit of a drilling because by then um, Cutthroat Island had just come out. And they were saying to me, look, that's a dreadful film. What on earth? Are you? I think they were getting second feet, cold feet, second thoughts about me doing the movie because they'd seen Cutthroat Island, which I thought was a good action movie. It didn't work as a movie, but there's actually some great action on it. And they said, what on earth are you doing on this and that? And I said, look, I work for the director, which you do. You're the, you know, as a coordinator or a director, second year director. You are that director's second eyes and you do what he wants and what the production wants, you know, and you have to be political and, and get the measure between the production and the director right. But basically you're working for that director. You're his, 
only directing it because he doesn't have the time to do it. Sometimes we can do it better because we're action people and it's action involved. But anyway, they, they give me a bit of a hard time about this. And anyway, it went down. And I worked very, very closely all the way through with that with Roger. And he can be a fiery character, but I think he's a very, very dedicated filmmaker and I think very talented. And there were changes, but you've got to think of the time. You know, we couldn't get a studio. We had to go over to, uh, over to um, just outside London there. Where was it called? Um, Fro- it was, was it, it Frogmore near, near Studios? Right? Yeah, Frogmore. We called it Frogmore. It was just an old warehouse. We had to turn it. It was on a runway. We had to turn it. And we're into a studio. And, we're, you know, we're writing the script. And then, say, halfway through it, when we're all set to go to Vietnam, we had production and coordinate uh, construction out there. They cancelled the visas like they did, you know, I was telling you about when we got to the airport and all sorts of things happened that didn't go wrong. They happened. This is what, what goes on in life, you know, things you can't account for or, or, or predict. And, you know, we, all you do, you have a problem and you solve it and you carry on and do the next, do the next bit. And uh, the opening sequence, you know, that was tough. It was, they wanted this, nobody could come up with an opening sequence. And I said, well, why don't we just give them the biggest gun fight we can get you know all, you know weapons of everything you can think of and so that's how the, the thing up in the in the alps evolved you know but it was having to think on your feet and invent things as you go along and uh, write them as you go along then yeah, there may have been odd problems with the production but I, I there's nothing unusual that doesn't happen on a lot of films there's always it's imagine. like a family you know it no matter how well a family gets on you can have little niggles and rows during it but yeah, it's no big deal Mm. Yeah. Well, with Tomorrow Never Dies, I mean, like we mentioned earlier, there's so many action scenes. Obviously, the pre-credits had so many explosions, and that was brilliant. You've got the bike chase in Thailand, and was it Jean-Pierre Goy who leapt over the helicopter, which was one of the best stunts in the film? That was fantastic as well. Um, and then obviously the car, pay, the car park chase with the Bond's remote control BMW. I mean, th- that is a lot. What was it like to coordinate that much action? That, that must have been, uh, well, great fun, but also logistically quite interesting as well. It was great, actually, the action on it, because they were wonderful Bond. They gave me as, as free range as you can have. Obviously, they're looking after the budget, and a lot of those are expensive sequences. And I love writing action, which is what I did for all of that. You know, I found the rooftops in Thailand, as I said earlier, and I designed all the action around locations. So you're not scratching here trying to find a location for a certain thing, whereas you write the action, you, you know, you find the location, then write the action around it. So as you say, I'm very proud of the bike chase through Saigon. That was, I think, terrific, you know, without getting too boring and it was Roger's idea, Spot is his idea about having a going from front to back and everything else on the bike. And I got so lucky getting Jean Pierre Goy, you know, the greatest motorcyclist in the world. He was fantastic. But that was pure fate. I'd, I'd come home from Thailand and I was exhausted. You know, I'd get jet lag and I was sitting in my office and thinking, God, I've got to make a decision because I've, I've had to find a motorcycle double for Pierce. And somebody had to be safe and everything else and talented and i i couldn't think and I, my brother had been mentioning this guy john pierre goy who he'd worked with in yugoslavia so i came home from thailand sat in my office turned the television on and some amazing stunts or something was on about remy julian i, I watched that and lo and behold john pierre goy's on it riding up over this bridge in france it's only this wide, and it goes up 135 feet and down, and up the next one. I thought, oh my God, this is the boy for me. He's fantastic. So I called him that night, and he came over the following morning to Frogmore, and put him on the BMW, a huge BMW, which nobody ever dreamt you could wheelie or do anything with. It's, you know, it's 18 inches too long to wheelie. Bloody great big thing, and with somebody sitting on the handlebars. And I said to him, you know, what can you do with this? And he just started smoking the tires and driving this thing around. Within 10 minutes, he had it popped on a back wheel. And then he was doing and stoppies and everything on it. And then he said, give me your stunt woman. I said, this is Wendy, my wife. Popped her on the handlebars. And he did a wheelie with her sitting on the handlebars on this, this bike. Just phenomenal. And funny enough, <laughs> a little side note to that. I was in, uh, in um, the restaurant. What's the restaurant that... Um, with all them film memorabilia, you know, that Schwarzenegger. Oh, Planet Hollywood. Hmm? Planet, Planet Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah. 
I was in a Planet Hollywood and they had one of these bikes in there. And I looked at it and I said, that's not the original from the film. They said, yeah, yeah, it is. I said, no, no, the original from the film has a ding in the tank like that. I said, what do you mean? I said, that's my wife's backside. Every time he came down from a wheelie, <laughs> went like that. They got two inches of suspension on the front. Her poor backside had beat a hole in, dump in the tank. Anyway, so he was doing wheelies on this thing and doing everything. Oh, this was fantastic. And, you know, the jump over the helicopter, that was a, a big one. Do we do it CG? And I've always said, you know, CG is you get out of jail free guy. You do as much as you can for real. So Bond were fantastic. We had the location built at Frogmore, the street and everything else. And we had the building jump from here to here. And I wanted the front of the building he was landing on made of soft breakaway styrofoam. So if he did come short, had a misfire as he took off, he could go through the front of the building. The top of it had to be look real, but he had to crash through into boxes as a catcher. So we had to rehearse the speed and everything else to do the jump for that location. So what we did, we built 7,000 or 10,000 boxes out this way, exactly the same distance as the jump across the street and the building would be. So daily we'd do one jump because it took all day to rebuild the boxes of Jean-Pierre, practicing what gear he'd be in, what speed he'd be doing, when he gave it the gun, and et cetera, et cetera. To balance the bikes, we didn't go in those first, all sorts of things. So... When the day came to shoot it, we had a helicopter there, which wasn't a real helicopter. They put blades on it, but the helicopter was there on a, on a, on a tripod. And he came and jumped over the top and went into the building. <coughs> so we could actually put our hands on our heart and say, no, we did that for real. He jumped across the street over the helicopter and landed. You know, it was important to me that we did that. And there was no wires, no cables, no nothing. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. What it's a great, great shot. Yeah. What a great stunt. <laughs> there are a lot of white faces holding their breath, waiting, you know, nervously <laughs> white faces, waiting for him to land. It was sensational. Absolutely. But yeah, it was great, unbelievable. Right. And he actually said to me one day, he said, Vic, I am so honored you let me do this with your wife on my motorbike. And I said, yes, Jean-Pierre, but you do not know how much I have insured for. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It could have been a nice payday, that one. <laughs> Sweet. So uh, you came back then, same job for World Is Not Enough, second unit directs, yeah? Um, and like we, we spoke about uh, earlier about the, the whole boat chase uh, along the Thames and stuff. But one thing I think is quite noticeable is you do see a lot of Pierce behind the wheel during that. Chase, he seemed like he was kind of up for giving it a go. Like, what, what, so how, obviously, a lot of it is that, you know, stunt as well, but like, how much of that was Pierce that he, he was allowed to do, I guess, is the question. Well, I think the important thing with all these action movies, they don't mean diddly squat unless you see Indy, you see Bond, you see the hero driving or doing whatever he's supposed to be doing in the movie. It doesn't mean anything. And it has to be shot in a way where you feel they're not just plugged in there on a green screen or in a little safe environment. So the way I like to do my action sequences is to shoot them if I can without the actors, knowing we then put it together, knowing where we would then need really good pops of the actors. And uh, we did that with the bond with the chase and then we got pierce for a couple of days up on the thames and we picked sweet spots for him to do and let him loose in the boat and i tell you you know my heart's in my mouth because at the end of the day he's off there and he's got that boat and one in particular one was where he comes past the houses of parliament and I'm, i think it's maybe hungerford bridge comes under the bridge and we were counting the the pillars exactly what pillar he's going to go through because we i was also photographing it this is pre-drone days drone days where we had a, a helicopter which was built around a film camera and uh so i'd have a little like a little aircraft carrier boat with a platform on the front driving down the thames that the camera operator a belgian outfit would fly this this um camera uh helicopter and go under the bridges with him and everything else and pick him up round and all that sort of stuff. So we had quite a flotilla of stuff, of boats. Anyway, this particular one, we go down and we had to go the third pillar over because there was a lot of wash, the tide was running and everything else. We didn't want to be in the next two pillars because there was, it was quite rough there with, a, with the effect of the bank pushing the tide over. So we're bumming along and I go under the, under the pier and... Pierce is coming and he disappears for a second behind the pier and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. He didn't come out. Oh my God, he's hit the pier. And then boom, he came roaring out the other side. So he, he just got a bit mistaken. Nice. But he had great fun. You see the water hit him in the face and it, it was just tremendous. It was such fun doing it. And uh, 
he loved it actually, you know, letting him loose. And the thing is, I can take him in my trailer and I've got the edited version of my version of the whatever the chase happens to be. Obviously, it's going to get tweaked and changed by the main unit director when the um, editor when they get into cutting rooms again. But at least he can see and he can get the atmosphere and, and get the whole the whole feel of what he's supposed to be delivering in those moments and where yeah. the funny moments and the bit with the tire is great, which the underwater bit we obviously did in Pinewood, but uh, you know, the lead up to it and the coming out of it we did with him. It was just great. It was just such fun. Beautiful. What a classic chase. And it really shows on the screen when, uh, how much fun he's having. Like that, it, that's what you want to see out of your bond when, when he's doing some sort of something daring, something action and he's got a smile on his face. And, and I think Pierce, just how game he was to to give it a go it really came across on screen and it just makes everything just uh it, it just makes it that next level in terms of when you're watching it you know the um action scene with the barrel roll um now was that a, a throwback to the man with the golden gun with the car barrel roll and who came up with that particular idea because that was brilliant oh right no no that was just I was working with Simon Crane, who was with my stunt coordinator on that one, who is now, you know, second directing on his in his own right, obviously now. Uh, no, we did tests and tests, and there was always going to be a barrel roll in it, and it, the biggest job was getting the boat to actually do the barrel roll because you can't make ramps and everything else. I think it was, it may have been. I don't think there was any mention of the, of the throwback to the old uh, Man with the Golden Gun. It was just it was just part of what we came up with with all those little sequences. Every Sunday, Simon and myself, I was shooting entrapment during the week. And every Sunday, I'd meet Simon and we'd go up and down the, the Thames and look at it, all sorts of scenarios. We had a chase about four hours long originally, and then we cut it down, cut it down, cut it down to pick all the sweet spots. And that was always going to be the culmination of, of that sort of sequence. And then Simon went off to over near uh, Blackbush and did some rehearsals in, on a lake there. Um, but we could never get that boat to turn over. It would always get upside down and, and go into the water. Because we, when we rehearse, we do it on water and hit the ramp. But then you land on the land, but on boxes, cardboard boxes, which breaks the fall of the... Uh, if anything's wrong, then you're just crashing into boxes. You still get a whack, but you've got a helmet on and everything else. And Gary Powell, who was driving the boat, was, was you know, there. And we could never get it over. And this, the, the amazing thing about the re revolution was, revolving the boat, was Dave Bickers, who's now not here anymore, great, great friend of mine. He, uh, he came up with the idea of getting the boat to spin. He said to me, if you hang that boat on a bit of rope, you could actually turn it with your hand, just like that, because it's, it's just the, the momentum of the boat. A ramp will just get it so far, and then it stops. So he said, if I put a, a, a nitrogen jet down and a nitrogen jet up, as it takes off, if you fire those, it's, it's weightless when it's in the air, and that will revolve it. We thought, wow, that sounds, sounds good. And, you know, he's a great inventor of, technic of uh, equipment, stunt equipment, Dave, bless him, was. And... Uh, he made this, and they tested it down there, and it worked perfectly. He flipped it right the way around, but it's still technically difficult to get it just one complete revolution. And in editing, we made it uh, do two. But uh, to my, you know, t to this day, I still think Gary Powell's uh, professionalism and timing was impeccable because when that bow goes up that ramp, you know, you you're going very fast, and you're bumping across the water, and you're holding on, you're trying to keep it straight. To have the presence of mind to hit that button because he's the one that's that's responsible for firing those jets which is going to spin the boat. And he's doing 60, 70 miles an hour, at least 60 anyway. And it would take your head off if it goes in upside down. You know, it's very, very dangerous. Really scary for me as a director because you feel so responsible. But it's his timing when he hit that button as he went up the ramp to get the thing over and land perfectly on its on its wheels, as it were, and carry on again. It was just phenomenal. Yeah. But that's the sort of pressure you get when you're doing a bond. It scares you to death. Yeah, I can imagine Watching. it does. So you, you mentioned there you were working on entrapment So at, at that time. So did, was, did Sean ever show much interest in what was happening in the Bond world at that stage or, or did it never come no, up? No, nothing at all. It never yeah. comes up. No. <laughs> Sean, Sean, and concentrate on this thing. And, uh, yeah, it, was, it was great fun though with Sean, I must say. You know, we did stuff. Funny enough, we did a sequence on entrapment that I had written for Bond. So on Tomorrow Never Dies, when they leave Carver's building, they slide down the pick the big face of Carver, yep. you know, on the rope, Absolutely. ripping it all the way down. Yeah. 
with the backstory to that was I'd been on entrapment and I'd been in on bond in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur with the Petronas Towers. And I had a sequence where they were going to swing around underneath the Petronas Towers. Then they pulled the, the permit to let us shoot in the Petronas Towers. We went to Hong Kong and I saw these big billboards in front of all the scaffolding on, on high rises. They were renovating Hong Kong. So that gave me the idea of of the face ripping all the way down for Bond. Yeah. So cut to later, when I go back to Kuala Lumpur, I said, I had a sequence in my mind for Bond, let's convert it, and we use it on entrapment. So when they, Connery and Catherine Zeta jones are underneath the wires, which again was Wendy, when the wires snap and they swing, that was a sort of a, a revamped version of what I was going to do on a Bond. Interesting. <laughs> That's, I love little stories like that that you can kind of catch. Yeah. That's great. Those little nuggets are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> really good. There was a couple of other um, really interesting action scenes on The World Is Not Enough. The uh, the Zukovsky factory, the Kevyar factory with a helicopter attack and the, the Parahawk ski chase. Now, that was an interesting one, seeing vehicles like the Parahawks. What were those sequences like to direct? They were they were great, actually, because I never believed you could fly with that great chainsaw underneath a helicopter for the uh, the, the factory sequence. And uh, they showed me pictures of it. They used it in America for running down the big power lines, for cutting the trees when they overhang the power lines. So it's actually a, a real object they use. But the technicalities with it, you know, you obviously can't land a helicopter with it because it's attached underneath it. So you have to build a big tower with a slot in it that the pilot comes in and reverses his, this big hang thing underneath from his skids into it. So he's now suspended 20 feet in the air when he lands his helicopter with these big things hanging down underneath. So that was all pretty tricky. And then I, I said to them, I need up shots. You know, the down shots are okay in Pinewood and everything else, which we had a lot of cranes and, and helicopters on cranes, all sorts of things and models. I said, we need up shots to justify what we're doing. You can't shoot it from these sort of angles we've got here. So give them their due, Bond, were fantastic. They, they took the whole set and took it down to um, down near Aldershot and built it. So I could then shoot underneath. We had the real helicopters flying over with these blades and everything else chasing us. So that was all, all pretty cool. And then what else was there you were saying? Uh, the Powerhawk sequence was another, another crack. The, power, the, the Powerhawks, yeah. I'd done a picture in Alaska in the 70s with uh, hydrocopters, which are boats with airplane engines on them that go across snow and ice and everything else. So we wanted something like that an updated version of a skidoo, if you like, that could also fly. So we, we amalgamated the two with paragliders and these these uh, these boat things that we built and did a lot of trial and error with them. And they were fantastic, actually, but they were quite fragile to fly. You know, in, in the Alps, you get a lot of wind and everything else. So we had to pick our days when the weather was good and everything else to fly them. So that, that was tough, but they were great because I wanted some shots with the camera, I, I, again, I used the little um, the little flying cam on the helicopter camera to do a lot of that, the flying out over the cliff and everything else and the, when the paraglider goes over the cliff. And I wanted these para, these para hawks to come out past camera, which you could never have done with a helicopter camera. Because this camera is so small, we could fly them close to it. It wasn't much downdraft. The one thing I regret on that, I did want, I got shot down in flames on, but uh, when Bond's been chased by the para, Parahawks, and they're on the ground before it goes over and turns into a parahawk. It's like a skidoo thing with baddies firing their guns at him, mm -hmm. and he falls. He's in fact he's conning them. He's sucking them into a into a suicidal bit where he, he tends to fall, and they go over the top of him, and then he thinks they're going to crash over this two thousand foot cliff. So the parahawk goes over the top of Bond down into the into the valley, and pop out comes the parachute. I wanted <laughs> to have a black parachute come out with the hammer with the uh, sickle and, and hammer on it of, of the USSR as an homage. Oh, that would have been immense. <laughs> I thought, boom, because he looks and goes, oh, my God, they're not, you know, it's yeah. like Butch Cassidy, the Sundance kid, the guy in the white hat, they're still coming, you know. Yeah. And so they go <laughs> over the edge and bam, like, oh, my God, and off he goes again. I thought that'd be quite a nice homage, but they didn't want that. <laughs> oh, that would have been a great little homage. <laughs> oh, that's that that's great, a shame, yeah. though. I thought it might have been a laugh, get a <laughs> yeah. laugh out of it, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So your last brush with Bond was Pierce's last, was Die Another Day, second unit director 
again. What were your memories of working on that one? Well, that was fun because we had the the uh, hovercraft and everything else, and you can't buy those hovercraft. They have to be made. And my boys in those days, one, Scott is now a stuntman, but he was uh, working with special effects in those days, and Bruce, my other son, is, is doing special effects. They were part of the crew that built those hovercraft for us. We designed them and built them, and then I had to get the stuntmen down to train how to, to drive them. It was quite funny, actually. Everybody thinks they can do things in, in stunt movies and everything else, stunts in movies. And I went down to uh, Portsmouth, where there's a huge hovercraft museum, because we wanted to see what size hovercrafts were available, what they could do, find out all the ins and outs of hovercraft and everything else. And we we're gonna, thinking we were going to design our own anyway. So I went down there, and they've got their expert hovercraft guy who had a small hovercraft there. It was quite good. And I said, okay, let's see how it goes. And they said, this guy's great. He'd make a great double for Bond for you and all that. I said, great, okay, that'd be fabulous. You know, what a good driver. So I gave him his instructions, go down to that pier there, turn around, come back, and then come past us on this side. And do a hard turn if you can and come around and go away from us. You know, just general instructions. But they were specific in as much as I wanted to see what this craft could do, given instructions. This guy came out, he disappeared over there, and then he turned around, he went over there, absolutely nowhere near what I wanted it to be. And we did this two or three times. He still couldn't get the idea of doing a run on a controlled run. So I, that's when I decided, right, we get stunt guys who know how to take orders. They know how to be precise. They know where the camera's going to be, where they have to deliver the goods, as it were. And we spent weeks down in order shop to, um, training them to drive these things and jump them and all that sort of stuff. So it was fun. But it was a nice sequence. So uh, something I'm, I'm always kind of curious about with with uh, technicians and stuff when it comes to movies is that sort of change from practical stunts to CGI. And of course, one of the famous ones from Dino of the Day was the whole kite surfing scene on the on the tidal wave, and obviously that's Pierce on a on a on a green screen somewhere. Like, what was your memories of like that sequence and and how that all sort of fits in <laughs> as an action man like you to to you know a, a computer sequence like that? What are your thoughts? One of the most embarrassing things I've ever been associated with. <laughs> it's horrendous. <laughs> Horrible. Well, I, I was trying to be polite in my question. <laughs> none, none of us wanted it. How it got in there, God only knows. That's a reduced version you saw as well. You know, yeah. it's, uh, I was so proud of the chase on ice because, again, to me, that was spectacular. And, again, fate worked with me on the chase on ice of the, of the Jaguar and the, the Aston on the ice. I went up to Iceland three times, and every time it was horizontal rain. You couldn't see across this room. And also, what do you do? Two cars chasing each other on an empty lake. There's no buses. There's no nuns walking across the road pushing prams. There's, there's nothing. You know, there's no interaction you can have like you do if you have a chase in a city or yeah. in, a, in a in a countryside. There's, there's all you got is icebergs and the flat flat ground. So to come up with the chase like it was, I think it was sensational. But I was so lucky with the weather. We went up there, and huge safety protocol because, you know, it's very, very dangerous. You're two or three kilometers out on a frozen lake. It's only 10 inches thick, the ice. And when the cars come by, it's like you're on a trampoline. The, the whole ground's going like that. And you think, oh, my God, the whole thing could just tip us in. And we yeah. all had survival suits on. You had to be signed into the lake and signed out at the end of the day. And I arrived there and started shooting. And my driver, the sun came out the, the, the morning I got there in the helicopter. The sun came out and I said, let's start shooting. We're never going to get sun like this again. They said, we can't. We don't have a camera. And, and they had a camera shooting plates, which is for the background of if you're going to do it on CG. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, let's grab that one. So I, I used my director's power and took the camera and helicopter <laughs> and we shot, shot these cars on the chase. But prior to that, we had to have the cars made four-wheel drive mm -hmm. because we couldn't have done a good controlled chase with just rear-wheel drive spikes on the cars. You know, you'd have been turning around and you wouldn't, you know, 360 in the cars accidentally. And so we did, Steve, uh, Chris Corbold and all the special effects boys did an amazing job. They, they took the engines out of the cars, put uh, Ford Explorer engines in with front wheel drives as well. So we had little eighth of an inch spikes. We had big spikes to begin with. They had too much traction. So we had down to eighth of an inch spikes, front and back, four wheel drive. So you could do power slides and all sorts of things. And it was great. And I was there, and I had 13 consecutive days of sunshine. I just shot and shot and shot and shot. It was wow. just beautiful. And the snow melted off all the icebergs. So you got this beautiful blue and this glistening on them. Some spectacular shots in it. And then I went up, <laughs> finished after 13 days. Then I, I, I left my unit to wrap up the stuff on the lake. 
pack everything up and get it off. And I went up onto the glacier to do the paraglide, or whatever you want to call it, the ice, ice yacht sequence, and did my yeah. bit of that for a couple of days. Then I came back down, and by then you couldn't, literally, a man couldn't walk on the lake, let alone take a car, and it did. melted that quickly. The rain came in, and the cloud came in, and we were on the glacier above it, so we didn't see it when we were up in the, on the glacier. But down below, the, the ice lake just melted. It was just phenomenal. But yeah, I don't know where that came from, how it, how it slipped in there, but there you go. That was, you, you can't that's what all. you were saying before <laughs> about fate as well, wasn't it? Like it was just oh, fate that suddenly yeah. the sun came out three weeks, perfect, shoot yeah. as much as you can, and then as soon as you finish, you you know, the, uh, you couldn't use the lake oh, after yeah. that. It's, it, that is fate, definitely. Oh, you couldn't buy it. You couldn't buy it. Some of those shots, you know, and I love the beer because – in the old days, you work on movies and you go to exotic locations. You go and see the movie and you don't see half of it. You see the interior of a room or out of a window. Whereas there, you know, it's a big, high helicopter shots of glaciers going through in foreground, icebergs in foreground, and some glacier shots and the blue. It was, I think, it was just a spectacular chase. It was wonderful. And funny enough, the end of it, where they go back into the ice palace, that was never scripted either. Um, they had. The ice palace was built for the party. It was a two-day shoot, massive construction in the 007 stage. And it was built for a party and a couple of other little sequences. And I said, look, we've got no real ending to the chase, the, the ice chase, because, you know, we had to write it on, on our feet as we're going along. Because, uh, as I say, you don't know what, what the view is going to be. What the, you don't know what the location is going to be. You don't know where the icebergs are going to be, because sometimes they flip over at night. And, and the iceberg that was there is now just a stump. The big bit's gone underwater. So I said, we've got no ending to the chase. If we could join up all these these rooms and, and this construction, which is the ice palace, we could actually finish the chase in there. So that's what they did. They, Peter Lamont and his gang were fantastic. They, they built all this, uh, all the platforms and everything else and decorated it all. So we actually finished the ice chase roaring through the palace and then coming out with his... Uh, into the uh, into the ice lake and going headfirst in and crashing. Yeah, it's nice. quite a nice ending to it. Beautiful stuff. Yeah, I think it worked well. And the ice palace was sort of melting at the same time, wasn't it? So it was kind of like that's right. You got all the, all the rain coming down, and yeah, it was it was, it was, it was fun because that matched up. Because I, I swear the lake was melting while we we're on it. Because sometimes you'd be standing <laughs> two inches of water, and you think well, this should be actually be two inches of ice. We're getting. <laughs> But yeah, the, all the, that's right. All the ice melting and dripping through. It was, it was pretty cool. It was again, it was unusual. You know, the people say to me, "What's the most difficult stunt you've ever done?" And I said, "Being original. That's the trickiest ever." You know, and I hadn't seen what we did in that ice chase. I hadn't seen that done before or inside. You know, it was, it was just unique and different and worthy of a bond. I thought. Nice. Well, you, you've sort of just half answered my very next question, which was to say, across your whole Bondian career, what would be the most challenging stunt that you ever did, and and your most favourite? If there is, if maybe there's two, you know, a favourite and a most challenging. Does anything spring to mind? No, they're all compounded on one on another. To me, it comes in as sequences. You know, it's, it's you don't want to sort of put all your eggs in one basket and have it as, as one particular thing. I think it, it's just the sequences, and they should build up to. You know the the bonds with going skiing over the top with the with the ice with the skis and the and the Union Jack that's fantastic. You know there's mm. Wayne's Wayne's jump off the dam they're great. You know so I couldn't uh, wouldn't want to put anything up against those sort of things. But I, I just judge mine by the overall story it's helped to tell in a Bond story really. You know mm. and the visuals and the ride you hope to take the audience on. You know from the car park at Brent Cross that we nearly burnt down and. Uh, yeah. But actually, if we're going back to Tomorrow Never Dies, that, that I wanted a when I designed the, the chase in the um, car park, Roger Spottiswood and I wrote that from Pinewood up to Stansted because we were going to Stansted to look at location. And Roger and I sat in the bus with the crew on it, and we just worked out this chase sequence. And I got out of the car, I saw Barbara mm. Brockley, and I said, no, I've, I've worked out the chase sequence for the car park. She, okay, tell me about it. And I told him it goes through these seven floors. She said, Vic, you're mad. It'll cost millions. I said, no, 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 no. We just have one floor. And we just change the colors on the floor and change the cars around. He goes out that door. He comes back in it the other way, and which is what we did. It was quite you know, efficient to shoot. We got permission to shoot at Brent Cross. And then I, I came up with all the different ideas. And I always like Sam Peckinpah's when a double barrel shotgun hits somebody and they do a snatchback, as we call it, on a cable. Yeah. 
they get snatched back. So I wanted a car come in at Bond and he goes, bam, with a rocket. And the rocket is the, the pseudo double barrel shotgun, hits the car and blows the car backwards. So it's, obviously it's going to be a huge explosion, which we did. And I let the car burn as long as I dare. And then black smoke was curling. And they couldn't start the, the fire uh, pump to put, to put the fire out. Oh, no. So it got bigger and bigger and bigger and smoke, smoke was billowing. I'm like, oh, my God, here we go. So we all left the building, as it were. And Dave Vickers, on the way out, told them how to start the, the, the auxiliary pump they had there. That's what the problem was. They couldn't fire this auxiliary pump out, a little Coventry Climax engine. And anyway, he told them how to start. it. got it going. They put the fire out. And there was an inquest that night, of course. You know, we nearly burnt down Brent Cross. We might not be allowed back next, next day and this, that, and the other. We went back the next day and the manager of Brent Cross was overjoyed because it had made all the newspapers, all the television channels, and people were flocking to Brent Cross to see the bond location. And, you know, they quadrupled their, 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 their output that day for okay, sales. Okay. How funny. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. That is- Sorry about that. <laughs> It's it's something that you hear like every time you read up about Bond in terms of when they're filming on location. Any other film, any other company would have been refused or frowned upon or anything like this. But as soon as the word Bond is mentioned, everyone just the doors open and 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 you get to do stuff which you can't do on any other films. Oh, absolutely! I always say it's a golden key. It's unbelievable. No matter where you are, what you're doing, unless it's Vietnam, I guess. <laughs> They welcome you with open arms, which they did in Vietnam even. And then I guess some some guys up higher up decided they didn't want to stay. Yeah. But up until then, it was going great guns. You know, they gave us com- uh, military helicopters fly all around up to Da Nang and Hanoi and everywhere. It's just brilliant. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a golden key. And it's just wonderful. I mentioned mention Bond. You know, I'm president of the James Bond Golf Society. And, you know, that gives us an entrance onto most golf courses if we want to play, you know, the charity events there. and uh, Or if I wear my Bond golf shirt when I'm playing golf in the variety club or anything, it always creates huge amount of interest. It's amazing. Bond, I'd be eternally grateful for every, all the times I've worked on Bond and all the joy it's given me watching it as well. You know, I'm just a great Bond fan and uh, uh, it, it's wonderful. But as I say, when you go in and knock on the mayor's door and say, excuse me, we're working for Bond. Can we come and shoot in your town? It's like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> even even if when you look at the, the boat chase on, 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 on the Thames there, we had a 50 caliber. Now, they're the loudest guns you can think of. You know, great big shells. It's a machine gun. Bam, 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 bam. You have to wear earplugs and it still makes your ears tingle. And we're running up and down outside the House of Parliament firing this 50 caliber. And we got a policeman come over to us and say, look, you've got to stop. I think he meant to say you're keeping the MPs awake. But anyway, you're disturbing the MPs. You've got to stop. <laughs> and, and Jack Straw, actually, of all people, stood, went in there and said, look, guys, this is a huge advert for London. The publicity, the tourism it creates. You're going to put up with it for a couple of days, please, because this is, you know, we should be happy that they're featuring. And yeah. so they let us carry on. No other film in the world. A would have been allowed to shoot in front of it, let alone carry on after uh, what we did. That's beautiful. But no, it, it's an amazing. Well done, amazing... Jack Straw. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We were going to be shut down. So, something I wanted to ask uh, ask you. Obviously, I've got a copy of your book right here, the uh, the True Adventures of the World's Greatest Stuntman. There it is, written mm. uh, co written by uh, Robert Sellers, obviously friend of the show, um, and. Uh, on the back there, it says you uh, you directed action scenes for all sorts of stuff. You know, Bond movies. You got Thor. You got Superman, Indiana Jones, and Mission Impossible Three. Which brings me to a question about Tom Cruise. So he famously likes to do his own stunts, doesn't he? Like in Mission Impossible Fallout, he's up there flying helicopters, jumping around all over the place. So my question to you is: Is that real, or is it is it really some stuntman and he's just pretending? No, it's real. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Oh, no. My son's done the last six with Tom and he's doing the next two at the moment. Yeah. No, Tom is amazing. He changed my mind about choreography for action stars. You know, I was always having wrestling matches with or arm wrestling uh, Harrison Ford to stop him doing his stunts, you know, because yeah. he's again another one that wants to do it. And Tom is exactly the same. I mission three with him and then I decided you have to design the stunt so he can do them uh, yeah. because he's capable of doing them. He's fantastic. But the only drawback is the risk factor involved. If something does happen, then you're in trouble, you know. 
on mission three with Tom, I had him laying on the ground. He comes down the parachute, hits the road, drops this file thing, he's got, and looks up, and there's a, a semi truck coming at him, tanker truck, and then Jack Nice and goes over the top of him. So I rehearsed it and rehearsed it, and I always like to be involved as much as I can to know what I'm going to tell my actors they're going to be doing. So I lay down on the road, and the, the guys come towards me, and you've got a guy at the back of the truck steering and a guy at the front steering. So they basically, between them, they turn it, but it's only, it's not horizontal it's at an angle so it's, it might be a 40 foot truck but you've only got about 20 foot of gap and if you're two foot off this way and your arms are out too far you could soon get run over so i lay there and they're running down a white line there's all sorts of precautions we take but at the end of the day you're laying under a truck that then has to be maneuvered to go over you and i remember doing that shot thinking Oh, this is the end of your career. You're the man that killed Tom Cruise. <laughs> and then another one, we rolled off into the Vatican. He had to roll off the top of this 70 foot wall and just drop horizontally and stop, just literally at ground level. You know, there's no leeway for an inch either way, although you get a face plant. Yeah. And I'm just there watching it shooting me, in fact. And he came down, his chest hit the ground, a little puff of dust came up. But nobody knows how dangerous, how, how tricky that was. And, you know, the, the, no, he, Tom, Tom does it, and it's redesigned the way we do stunts. CG has had a tremendous boost for us for that because you can now have your restraining cables, you can have your safety in shot much, much more than we could because it can be erased a lot easier. But yeah. at the end of the day, he's going to put his watches in his mouth and Go for it. Yeah. And uh, he's, he, he's got cojones, there's no doubt about that. Good on him. Good on him. And now that's where you use CGI, where it's used properly in films, where you don't know it's there almost. That's when it's done correctly as opposed to your kite surfing tsunamis and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I know, absolutely. And, and that's what people ask me. and said, you know, what do you think about CG? And I keep saying it's a fantastic tool. It's wonderful, but it's like morphine. Yeah. Then, what do you mean? I said, well, morphine used in the right quantities for the right ailment is a godsend. People are begging for it. Hmm. When it's abused and overused for the wrong reasons, it's a killer and it can kill people. That's exactly what CG is. And used in the right way. And people say, I said, you know, I think CG has ruined more films than it's made. And they say, well, what films? I said, I can't say the ones it's ruined because, I, you know, they're all my, a lot of my friends and I've probably worked on a lot of them as well. <laughs> they said, well, what, what, what good films can you see? And I said, well, you don't know it's CG because that's the good thing about it. You can't tell it's been used. That's yeah. the wonderful thing when it's used correctly. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I, there was one thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of stunts, Vic, and how they're sort of represented or not represented at the Oscars. So you previously won a Technical Achievement Award for the Oscars. Um, was that for the Fan Descender? I think it might have been. But do you do you think the, they should have an Oscar for like the best stunt or an Oscar for the best stunt team? Or do you think they should just leave stunts out of the Oscars altogether? No, I think 100% we should be represented in at the Oscars. You can't have an Oscar, though, for somebody falling down the stairs on fire or crashing a car or something. It has to be an ensemble or... Or, or the, as hairdressing is, or as sound is, it has to be an overall effect that it, it contributes to the production or the movie, the enjoyment of the movie you're watching. So it should be the stunt coordinator, probably. The stunt coordinator should get it, and then he would nominate his right-hand man or left-hand man or whatever that he wants to. But, yes, I, I do. You know, you think you've got, you've got two for sound, but I think they've actually amalgamated them into one unit now for sound. But there's a, several categories with two categories in it for different parts of what they're doing. And I'm not saying they're unworthy of it, but I'm saying that stunts definitely should be worthy of it. But for the right reasons, it should be for the contribution it gives to the movie. And the man normally in, in charge of that is the stunt coordinator. He's the one that's had to do all the political wrangling with the production, with the actors, with the accountants to get that whole thing together, to employ the people, to dream up the sequences, make them safe and everything else, whether he organised them or not. He's going to bring people in that can organise them. So, yeah, I think the stunt coordinator should get an Academy Award. I'm lucky to have an Academy Award, but it's not an Oscar. It's a science and technology one. I'm lucky enough to get a BAFTA. I'm the only stuntman ever to get a BAFTA. But, again, that was a Lifetime Achievement Award. And we do have our Taurus Awards, which are our Oscars, but... But Oscars are Oscars, and I, I seriously, th and I think we will get there. We're getting a lot of 
ground support now. And dear old Brad Pitt gave us a nudge as well, you know. So I think eventually their their main argument is there's not not enough time for it. But I think uh, uh, all right, we'll see. Uh, I think that's I think there is time for it. You know, I've been to the Oscar ceremony and uh, there's a huge amount of documentaries and all sorts of things that are uh, you know take just as much time. And I think nowadays stunts do contribute a huge amount to the enjoyment and the telling of stories. Absolutely. It's, it's an art form, if, if you, nothing else, yeah. as well as a, as, a, as a technical thing, for sure. Sorry, Chris, after you, mate. Well, yeah, no, I was just going to say, basically, if you're watching a trailer for any film, particularly, obviously, an action film, and you take the stunts out, you're not going to get anything in the trailer, are you? You know, that's what brings the people to the seats in the cinema, is seeing these amazing action set pieces. So they really should really should be represented at the Oscars, I think. Oh, absolutely. It's a good point, you know, because every trailer, if there's any sort of action in it, that's what they show to get bums on seats, you know, so it must, it must contribute something to the enjoyment of the movie. Nicely done. So <laughs> last question then for you, Vic, is what's next for Vic Armstrong? What, obviously not a lot going on in the world at the moment because of the whole, uh, you know, COVID-19 thing, but what's next for Vic Armstrong? What, what are you working on? What are you up to? I came back from New Zealand a couple of days before they shut everything down. I'm doing a, a series there of uh, it's an Amazon show, but it's it's supposed to be top secret at the moment. But it's mm -hmm. um, it'll be you know a couple of years work. I've also got a couple of movies I like directing, and you know I did a Sunday Horse, which I believe is being purchased, and that's going to be shown in a, in North America soon. I've done a couple, you know, three or four movies I've directed. So uh, there's, there's another one in the pipeline which I'd like to do. I love directing. I love the creativity of it. So I, I'm supposed to go back to New Zealand in July to carry on, pick up where we left off there, unless I get a really nice movie to direct on my own. Nice. Yeah, fair play. That'd be Sounds brilliant. Good. Do you work um, with your family quite a lot? Because obviously Team Armstrong is pretty pretty well known in the, in the stunt industry for, for a lot of your family being involved. Do you tend to get to work with your sons and your daughters quite a lot or...? I try to as much as I can. Wendy, obviously, you know, we travel together, so that's great. The kids are grown up and they're all working in the business now. And when we did Spider-Man, um, there were eight, because I had my brother on it as well and my two nephews, so there were like eight Armstrongs on that one. Uh, Green <laughs> well. Hornet, there's seven or eight of us on that. I do like them because they're all brilliant at their job. Um there's not much of an apprenticeship these days. You know, nobody has a stunt apprenticeship, but these kids have had a full-blown stunt apprenticeship. You know, they've grown up watching me design things. They've seen me sitting around the kitchen table with Dave Bickers and all the other guys dreaming up sequences and how we work them out. And they've watched me rehearse them at home. And when we come back from locations, we get the airbag out and clean it and they jump out the bedroom windows into it and all that sort of stuff. So they, they've known <laughs> the ins and outs of the business. So uh, it's wonderful working with them. In that respect, in other words, I, in other times, I hate it. You know, I'm, I'm sure I wasn't grey-haired before I did the Green Hornet because the first crash in the Green Hornet, it was all about cars wrecking, was my brother doing a cannon roll, which, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a crash at 70 miles an hour. You're going to flip down the freeway about you know, six or seven times. So that's my first night shooting. The second night was my youngest son, Scott, who's now working on with... Uh, with Tom on Tom Cruise on the, those pictures, he had to do a driver pick up on fire, head on impact into a bus out the top of the bus, not a double decker, a single decker bus out through the top of it and crash down the street on fire, which was nerve wracking. And then the third night, my nephew James had to do an end over cannon in a in a pickup truck, which is it was a real that's a real whacker when you hit that. So you know I'm there, I'm the director, and supposed to be. You know, Mr. Cool, watch everything going, and you see your son, your brother, your nephew, whoever it is, strapped into this car, and you know it's going to be one hell of a wreck. And you have to say, okay, roll cameras and action. And in your mind, you're going, action! <laughs> <It's just laughs> I can imagine. Uh, but you have to be totally calm because keep everybody else calm. But you know, luckily, it all works out well, but uh, it's nerve wracking. Absolutely. At least. 100%. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Vic. I, I, like I said at the beginning, I know you don't do a lot of these kinds of things, so we really appreciate your time. I think our listeners are going to absolutely love this uh, this interview. It's uh, It's been a corker. Jolly good. Thank you very much, and uh, carry on, Bond. Can't absolutely. wait to see the next one. It's going to be great. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 
Fingers crossed for that, Vic. Fingers crossed. Well, have a good yeah. one, and thanks for all the stories. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Ciao. How cool was that, man? Mate, I absolutely loved that. He's so many stories, didn't he? Like yeah. some of the ones you know you kind of heard before, but there was a lot there, a lot of new material. And it's just when you just think about all the stuff that he's worked on and the stunts that he's done and, you know, he, he just can't be beaten, can he? It's like top no. top sort of stunt man in the world, as his book says, you know, the greatest stunt man in the world. That's it. It's one of the that one of those things that when I sort of emailed back and forth with him to to organise, he was like, you know, how how long do you need? And I said, you know, would about an hour be okay? And he was like, yeah, that's fine. And then of yeah. course, you know, ninety minutes in, we're still chatting. And it's one of those things where I feel like you could do a hundred episodes with Vic, and there would be new stories in every single one of them. Yeah. And the other thing is, like with these interviews, sometimes you never know how it's going to go. And with this one, yeah. basically, I still reckon he would have been chatting for a good hour or two afterwards if if uh, you know if the batteries weren't gonna run out or whatever yeah he, yeah. Yeah, he was Absolutely. loving it but yeah i mean he was he was quality uh, what what was the best sort of little snippet that he gave us for today for you what do you reckon oh man i suppose i do love the old ones like you know the story of being stood at the top of the volcano from you only twice you know and, and preparing to jump down there and stuff I, like i do love those That's but then insane. i also love yeah and i do i also love those ones that are sort of less sort of commonly talked about like you know never say never again or something like that the horse jump and all those kinds of things i find those sort of lesser known or lesser talked about things i should say quite intriguing as well and you you being a, a big stunt dude like what was your favorite um oh, oh, uh, to be honest i loved it all um yeah nice. no it's good it's great hearing how you know there was just no safety equipment back in like yeah. you said the volcano he's hanging off the top of this thing 120 feet in the air sticking his bomb out over the edge of the girder with just a little bit of rope and a little bit of hose. And yeah. it, it's just insane, isn't it? Um, I did think it was pretty interesting that, you know, his favourite Bond film was Tomorrow Never Dies. Obviously, we reviewed yeah. that, you know, uh, a couple of films ago. But there is a lot of decent action in that film, like the car yeah. chase and uh, obviously the pre-titles is wicked. And yeah, it's it's, it's a really good film, that. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, it's just just great to chat with him. Absolutely. What a beauty. So to everybody watching or listening at home, make sure you go and grab a copy of Vic's book. I'm holding it up for the camera there. The True Adventures of the World's Greatest Stuntman. And like when you look at the back, I mean, the the, the introduction is written by Steven Spielberg. That's I mean, that's, tell that tells you something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Spiel and, I mean, this I mean, guy's worked with like obviously Spielberg, it, it, you know, Harrison Ford, Lowe's, George Lucas, Arnie, yeah. Sylvester Sloan. All the big names, like in terms of directing and car, he just he's worked with everyone basically in Hollywood, hasn't he? Well, that's it. And I mean, like if you look at the back cover of the book, there's there's a a, a quote. There's a couple of quotes at the top of the of the book. First one, Steven Spielberg says, "No CGI can match what Vic can accomplish." And then the next quote is Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, "No one does action sequences better than Vic." Wow. So it's kind of like it doesn't come any higher than that, does it? And then if Not you flip through the book. Like just the photos of the people he's with, man. It's you know Tom Cruise, you've got Arnie, you've got Will Smith, you've got Steven Spielberg, you've got obviously Indiana Jones, man. Oh, mate, I mean, I'm oh, I'm a huge Indy just, fan as well. Um, it was so cool just to uh, like speak to him from that point of view as well. In terms yeah. of like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just just brilliant. <laughs> it, isn't it lovely as well when when they're super down to earth people as well? I love that. You know yeah. what I mean? When it's but, like, I mean, you don't get bigger than that. Yet he's the most normal dude to speak to in the world. Well, that's, you know what? I think you find that more and more in terms of with people who are at the top. I think there are people who want to be at the top, but maybe not yeah. quite there. And they're the ones with a little chip on the shoulder. But when you get to yeah. the absolute legends who've been there from, you know, day one, know everything about the game and, and the industry and everything. And when they're yeah. that humble, it's, it just puts them on another tier, doesn't it? It really does. Doesn't it just? Yeah, yeah. doesn't it just? Well, wicked! What a great episode today. How, how are you doing, man, over there in Cardiff? You doing all right? Yeah, not too. I mean, this whole obviously lockdown, we're still going through that, and uh, I've not been able to do any bungee jumps recently. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, it's 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 is a strange time, isn't it, mate? It's obviously we are yeah. missing, you know, are doing our little catch ups and stuff. So um, mm. there is that, but I've got a few things to look forward to. A nice little Thank trip you. planned for December, if nice you know, lockdown isn't happening then. Um, mm. I might pay a little trip 
to a certain James Bond location, which I know you visited on a couple of previous occasions. So. Beautiful. Yeah, yes. nice. Yeah, we'll That'll see. be good, man. Yeah. And you never know. I, I might see if I can be out oh, there as well at the same time. So can. we can do the Bond and Scaramanga oh, photo. Back Dude, to back. can you imagine? There it is. Yeah. There it is. Oh, baby. That would yeah. be cool. <laughs> now, so we should explain to everybody, uh, we, we're doing this with the most convoluted setup possible because your internet is notoriously terrible in the yeah. sense that you get on for a Skype call or whatever and it just cuts out within a second and it's just this complete nightmare. So yeah. basically, I'm phoning you on your missus's phone, recording yep. that whilst you're recording your audio <laughs> through your nice microphone separately, which you're then going to yeah. send to me later so I can replace the phone call audio, which I'm listening to, <laughs> with nice crisp audio. Yeah. So it, that's, you know... We're, this we're, is we're, the dedication of what we go to, Tom. This is it. There you go, man. <laughs> but what, what I will say, though, is that I'm thankful for that wife because then you know there would be an excuse to do die another day sooner but because we have to do it in this convoluted way it makes the whole process more difficult so yeah. it's a good excuse to keep that one on the shelf for a little while i, I think we're just going to have to keep people waiting on that one what do you yeah, think yeah 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 me too absolutely right. i tell you what though wasn't his reaction to the whole uh tidal wave kite surfing scene great wasn't yep. that brilliant yeah well we had to ask it didn't we and like yeah i'm so you know he obviously thinks the same as we all do it was an absolute pile of so and so but when mm. like he was right you know you get this the car chase on the ice and that was a great scene and a great action set piece and then you've got this yeah. dodgy like oh you don't even go there but you know yeah, yeah. i'm glad you know that he sort of said what he did yeah yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um cool stuff all right then man well thanks for, for joining us all today it's always a pleasure to hear your voice on jbr man it's always a pleasure well, a pleasure to be here, mate. Look forward to some more future episodes. All right, dude. Cool. All right, then. Well, uh, you take care of yourself, and James Bond Radio will return next week. Until then, I've been Tom Sears. I've been Chris Wright. And we'll see you soon, everybody. See ya. Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed the show. Good night.